the ADNA podcast. Today is a very special bonus, bonus episode. Right, Thomas? Bonus, bonus. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'm so glad that we're doing this. Being a part of Read My Mind Radio has been an honor from the first time that, that I learned about you and was a part of your conversation and following all the amazing podcast episodes that you've released over the many years that you've been doing this. It's uh, This is really great. I'm so glad that we're talking. Very cool. Very cool. So I'm glad to be here with you and have you here with me. <laughs> this is fun. So, yeah. Cool. So... What I wanted to start with, right, is the ADNA, because what I've noticed, and so you tell me what you want to talk about this, but what I've noticed is that when you started the ADNA, you had this sort of a specific vision, but it seemed to expand over time. So can you tell us a little about that expansion and where you are today? When the ADNA started, it was originally just the voice talents. And the strategy behind the ADNA was to eventually grow it to include writers and engineers and quality control specialists, the many roles in audio description, but that felt like a little too much to wrap our heads around. And the one thing that seemed to anchor most audio description is the experience of the voice talent and knowing who that person was, know your narrator. And being able to start with that, that's something that was really tangible that could be in the ears of people and know that, oh, that's that's so-and-so, I love that voice, or that's Thomas Reed, oh my gosh, anything that he's in, I want to be a part of. And I found myself thinking, like, I follow my favorite voice talents because of the work that they do. And if they're involved in something, I want to I want to hear what that is. And so putting a showcase on the voice, not only to celebrate those specific voice talents efforts, but also to give a language to people to be able to talk about audio description, quality and excellence and give them something to anchor in on. And starting with voice talents seemed like a great place to start strategically and see how that goes. And as it grew into including writers, which it now does, as well as the engineers and the quality control specialists, it's the Audio Description Network Alliance. It's become a lot more inclusive, specifically about film and TV at this point. Your involvement in audio description has also seemed to broaden. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, can you talk a little about your journey from narrator to what I think is a, a lot of advocacy. Uh, I appreciate you using that word. It's, uh, it's, it carries with it a, a lot of responsibility, and I, I hope I am serving the advocacy when it comes to audio description. I'm a sighted person who has worked in voiceover work, and when I had the opportunity to do audio description, for the first few times, I was literally isolated. It was a a very small booth. I was directed by one person and there was an engineer and I was cast and, and that was pretty much it. The exposure was very limited. And as I started doing it more and more, I found some opportunities to, to make the work better. And I've simultaneously, personally, one of my friends who uh, was in the hospital had lost all of his sight. And we had a conversation where it was, Hey, Roy, that episode was so funny in that second season of uh, whatever show we were watching. And it was like, oh, my gosh, that was so funny. And we had a conversation. We weren't talking about the hospital visits or the nurses or the, the shots or all the, all the things that were happening. We were having a conversation about a television show that we both loved. And there were no gaps. There wasn't this separation like we're driving down the freeway and all of a sudden there's a speed bump those speed bumps were eliminated and it was because of the audio description. And it, that was the click, man. That was when it was like, this connection means so much. And he was able to fully focus on the conversation because the audio description didn't get in the way of the show. And that was, that was really the start of, of a few different things. Meeting Kevin was uh, one of the first people that I met who was an audience member of audio description. And I couldn't have been treated by a better person. He knew audio description back and forth. He had a real passion for it. And he shared his experience of not only watching audio description, but also living as a blind person and some other intersectionality that that came with that. And thankfully, he was open enough to share some of his experiences and and help guide some of my assumptions that I have uh, about when it comes to being a blind person or when it comes to being, a, I guess, a, a watcher of audio description. Now, he doesn't represent everyone. He's not the 36 million blind and low vision Americans. He's not speaking for everybody. But what he did was he taught me how to listen. And I think that that's really been a guiding force in making, in making sure that audio description is in parody to sighted audiences experience. Love it. I love it. Yeah, that's cool, man. For me, again, it always comes back to, to people. And that's what you just said. Not just about that audio description, but it's the power of the people. And, what it represents for them. So that's really cool. 
So AD advocacy has all the different forms. There's that legislative stuff. There's the reaching out to broadcasters, distributors, and all of that, right? But what you're doing seems to be more in your wheelhouse, as they say, right? And that's that's with the voiceover talent industry. So can you talk about some of what's been happening there? And so specifically, I'm talking about if you want to go into the Sovas first and then lead into the Emmys. Sure. Uh, let's let's take just a little step back when it comes to the legislative side that that mandate, and this is just my personal opinion. Okay. I don't, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I do feel that that mandate is an absolute necessity, that having the FCC demand so many hours of broadcast television to include audio description has been so influential in where we are today, and it's a necessity to continue being there. I've found that when it comes to mandates, at least the way that they're structured now, it brings things to a certain level. And as long as that level's met, as long as that box is checked, we're good. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. And if we could go back to what we were saying earlier about connecting to people, that audio description, I think, is an excellent model for when it comes to disability representation in the sense that there is this assumption, well, as long as we check the box, we're good. And that, I think, really affects the quality of audio description. And I think that's where the, the ADNA podcast came in, is to introduce people to the many different experts who are contributing to excellent audio description and the nuances and the layers and the interactions that go into this work that's so much more than just a transcription. And so seeing that mandate as a necessity and then also recognizing what if there was a different question that was being asked? What if the question wasn't how much or how cheap we can make audio description, but how great can we make it? And that seems like it's self-serving coming from a voice talent. In a sense, it is. But the point of that is, again, back to modeling audio description as a representation of equal access and making sure that people are included in this work, is that by making audio description excellent, it brings it to a higher standard. Instead of saying, at least we get to this point, like what the mandate does, I think that audio description quality and excellence starts at a minimum level of quality and there's a race to see how great it can be and how wonderful it can be and how immersive it can be how far can you push this to make it as great as it can be and the results of that is that the audience has a better experience and the kinds of people who are involved with it are bringing their all and the care and the the talent and the skills that you and i both know are involved in this work so one of the things that became really important is the outreach to the entertainment industry in the sense that there are a lot of companies that provide audio description. I personally know one of the showrunners for a, a TV show who didn't even know that I was voicing his own show for audio description. It was so separate. And that was a little surprise for both of us. And being able to have the conversations with different producers and directors about their experience and having them lean in with curiosity and say, you mean I can reach nearly 30 million, 36 million blind and low vision Americans, let alone 250 million worldwide, plus all their family. Like this is an untapped resource to get their stories told to people that might not know about it. And that was a real exciting moment for them. So it's like, how can we combine all this back to that whole modeling thing and say, this is a way that we can bring more accessibility to people who are watching audio description and the people that create it who may or may not be blind or sighted. So where Sovas came in is uh, a few years ago. Sovas is a society of voice arts and sciences, and they have uh, awards for voice talents. It has nothing to do with audio description historically, but I uh, was nominated for a Sovas award for a narration category. So it was an audio description narration that I was nominated for. And I was able to use that to leverage, hey, here's this thing, audio description. And over the past few years, I've been working with Sovas. And specifically this year, 2021, I've been talking with the heads of Sovas and sharing some of my experiences as a sighted person and what that means and to make sure that blind people are judges for audio description when the audio description awards were a part of their categories for awards. And this just kind of kept going and being able to see them not only embrace audio description, but really get it as far as including audio description in their own promotion 
of their own stuff, making sure that when they post on social media that they have alt text to be sure that blind people are included in this work. And that's, it's new to them and they're, they're working their way through, but it's just been amazing to see that that connection, which is completely outside of the blind organizations, is now recognizing voice talents in this work. And I think that in a good way, it's going to start bringing more quality. Okay. And what about the Emmys? What about the Emmys, Thomas? <laughs> this is great. So uh, the Primetime Emmy Awards are done by the Television Academy, and uh, they've got a great mission. I've been a part of the Television Academy for, uh, uh, I'm going to guess, maybe 10 or so years, so relatively new uh, speaking. And part of my contribution has been as a performer's peer group executive committee member. It's basically a fancy term for all the different peer groups that represent different roles of television, and they get together and support the the different areas. I was in the performer's peer group executive committee, and so letting them know about audio description and how that has such an impact on television and how it can have an even greater impact. And so those conversations have really evolved from the first time that I was uh, approached by my mentor and saying, hey, you should really reach out here and, and being able to do it in a way that went from almost a dismissive, well, you know, there's really nothing that we can do about this, but Roy has a real passion for it. So, you know, keep in mind that whatever Roy talks about, it's, it, it's probably not going to happen. Take it away, Roy. This is such a valuable uh, performance and it's a skill it's an access that brings so much to so many people beyond blind and sighted people. Let's hear about audio description. And that was the introduction. It was basically 180 degree turnaround time simply because the culture has changed as well as the awareness of what audio description is. And through some real advocacy within the Television Academy, the Television Academy now recognizes audio description narrators as qualifying credits, television credits, to become full-fledged members to be able to vote for the Primetime Emmy Awards. And I think the implications of that are, are a few. First of all, again, representation, making sure that people understand about audio description, but also as many blind people work in audio description as voice talents, this is yet another way for them to be included in this television academy, whereas normally the opportunities might not be there as much. So that feels really huge. Hmm. So, in general, let me just say that I'm not I really a big <laughs> fan. <right>? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big fan of awards, award shows mm -hmm. in general, right? Now, I admit, it's a, it's a great business move to gather the top celebrities and harness all of that attention and, and brand yourself as the, the gatekeeper. That's a great business move. Mm -hmm. But I'm really sort of in this episode asking questions around audio description, questions that pertain to that, questions that pertain to the future. And when I, when I do that, when I think of audio description, one of the first things that I usually apply to everything AD is how does it impact the experience for blind people? And I realize that it could be direct at times, right? A one for one exchange. This happens and then this happens. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it's not, mm. it's not necessarily obvious. So how does this help blind people? Let's go back to what we said earlier about the, uh, the mandate versus the opportunity in the sense of a mandate brings things up to a certain level. And as long as we meet that level, we're good. That that's enough. That's good enough. That whole good enough philosophy. I think when it comes to celebrating the work of audio description, particularly in the SOVAS, because right now we're, uh, that's, the, that's the award show that, that does acknowledge the, the contributions of, of voice talents, that they have found a way to, to share the performance in a way that, that celebrates it. And it is creating a competition in the sense of the people that are voting for the audio description narrators are going to choose the best. If there's going to be a handful of uh, submissions or if there's going to be hundreds of submissions, they're going to have to narrow it down. And to narrow it down, they're going to have to choose the best. And by celebrating which are the best, that that's going to impact our audiences, I think down the road, let's, let's use the, 
um, knocking the dominoes over that are standing up, that this will lead to more quality because people are going to want to have good voice talents to be able to be a part of this awards ceremony, which will lead to better audio description. It's almost a cart before the horse sort of situation. One of the things that I love about the television academy to contrast with the the sovas is that this is a way for the emmy awards to be a part of the the television academy to be able to vote for the emmy awards it's including more people into the conversation that ordinarily might not have the opportunity when it comes to representation of disability that is something that is happening a lot more often and one of the challenges seems to be able to get those opportunities Audio description, I think, allows for that a lot more cleanly than something that might be on camera, that every single piece of content that comes out can have audio description. And that means that there are that many opportunities for a voice talent and particularly who are blind to be able to contribute to this. And so it's one more step of including people into something. And again, I, I hear what you're saying about the, the resistance to the awards ceremony, that there is something about that, that that doesn't feel right or disingenuous, or how is it going to help with audio description? And I respect that. I think that the impact that we're talking about here is that it is including people who are blind to be able to, to share their thoughts in a way that kind of have been excluded for years. So um, back to the example of audio description being a model. This isn't the be all end all, but it is one way to say, look, audio description did this, or look, closed captioning did this. And now look at how closed captioning is, is so common and in the sense of being everywhere and how audio description can be a little different than closed captioning, but also be that kind of awareness that can really grow. So I'm, I'm kind of dancing around your question a little bit. Am I, am I getting closer to uh, uh, what's in it for audio description audiences? I, I think, but what what I'm hearing though um, is that it's still so dependent on, for example, who's judging. That's a really big question in my mind because, like you said earlier, I think the only people who should be judging audio description are the consumers. Really, I mean, th those are we are the judges, and if we're not judging, I'm fearful that it's. So, for example. What is being judged? Is it just that performance, right? Because we know that a big part of audio description also is the writing, right? The biggest part of it is the writing. Yes. So what are they what are they using to make that determination? And if we're if we're looking at just voice talent, well, it's probably just gonna be all the the stuff that makes a good voice artist. And so that just really I'm still very, very much concerned about that. I'm also concerned with the idea that and this is something that I kind of heard floated around before, that when a lot of attention is placed onto who the narrator is, does that end up becoming something where, you know, again, we're focusing on the narrator and then we start to bring in, like, for example, celebrities to narrate. And I've heard that idea flown around as though it would be of benefit. But I'm really concerned about that. Again, just taking all of that attention away from the consumer and again, I'm always thinking the consumer, the blind folks should be centered in audio description. And so anything that moves away from that, yeah, my, my spidey senses are going up. It's beautiful. I love <laughs> how you put that. It's good. It's good. And I, let's address both parts because this is, again, just the, the Sovas Awards that those judges who are judging audio description are blind. My understanding and the conversations that I've had with the leadership of Sovas is that you can't do this award without having blind judges. I'm assuming that the people who were invited who are blind have responded. I, I can't know that. That's not my business. But it is my understanding that that was specifically a part of this arrangement. That's something that we made explicitly clear. <laughs> that it's like, because this whole nothing about us without us, this entire audio description was created by blind people for blind people. Blind people need to be judging it. That is absolutely essential. So my understanding is that that is a part of the Sovas when it comes to judging the audio description. And if you've heard something different, I'd, I'd love to, to know about that. As to the other point of writing, that you're right. The, in the same way that the ADNA started with voice talents, just to help people wrap their head around it, my understanding is that there's going to be opportunities in the future for awards for writing or for engineering, that we can start to separate this. 
one of my biggest concerns about audio description is that there's this catch-all term called the describer. It's so ambiguous, and each company has a different idea of what the describer is. We've already mentioned the four or five different roles in audio description, and by saying, oh, a describer described this, it makes it seem like it's one person that spent an afternoon in a, in a little studio and threw something together instead of the many different roles and opportunities that are created in the creation of audio description. So helping to pivot the conversation from this catch-all term to the different roles. And with all due respect for those who do multiple roles in audio description, Let's celebrate those as the auteurs in the same way it's a director producer or a, a writer director that those are distinguished within the entertainment industry. And by us distinguishing the many different roles in audio description, we can start to educate not only our audiences, but also the entertainment industry. But let's go back to the important part, which is your concern about making sure that the attention is placed where it needs to be on the audience's experience. And when it comes to the attention being placed on the narrator, yeah, there are narration skills that go into it, but I agree with you. It's the writing that makes a ton of difference. And the example I like to use is that if we use, let's say, a, a Shakespeare play and you go through the first act and it's it's the intermission and you're just moved to tears by the performances that have happened. And it, there's something that really connected viscerally with the, with the engagement of the different characters and how they were interacting with each other and whatever thing that that story was was telling. You could be just move to tears and almost be stuck. The same thing could happen at the end of the first act where you're in tears because you just want to get out of the theater. It's the worst performance you've ever seen. And you just got to get you. You're trying to figure out how to get out of seeing the second act because it sucks so much. In both examples, the writing was equal, but there was something that happened and it was most likely the performance. It could have been the the audio glitches that may have been happening if if it, for example, was in a big auditorium that had the the microphones cutting out. It could have been all sorts of other things that got in the way of the performance. But the the writing was the same. And so where I'm pivoting to now is the idea that audio description has so many different roles that the weakest link can make the whole audio description suck. And that's that's where everything has to be lifted up. And again, it is for the audience's experience that by celebrating each of these different roles, we can celebrate audio description excellence and quality. I'm still kind of not answering your question though, because I still hear the, the concern about the celebrities. And I have to use my experience as a, a voice talent that basically celebrities never used to do commercials. Mm -hmm. and now that's very common. Celebrities didn't used to do animated features. And, you know, we look at Toy Story, which is now, what, 20 years old? And there's still voice talents that are still voicing animation that by having a celebrity involved in this work, I mean, as early as Buster Rhymes back in, what, 15, 20 years ago for the Stevie Wonder video, mm -hmm. What the Fuss? Yeah. I mean, that was the that was exquisite. The first time I heard that, I'm like, oh, this is so good. I can't help but smile and nod my head. It's so beautiful. It's like there was something that Busta Rhymes, the celebrity, brought to that, that brought that piece alive. Not every celebrity can do this. And if there are celebrities that do it, I would hope that the focus still remains on the audio description. But you're right, there's no way to control that. I don't know how to address that, but I do see that the possibility of that kind of exposure can only grow the quality of this. Well, we're going to have to disagree with me. Yeah, disagree with yeah. me. <laughs> because, you know, no, I get I, like I get the Buster example. But then again, I would have to kind of go back and listen because I think there was a second one and, and no shots to Buster. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not convinced that the celebrity would make a difference. I think the celebrity might make a difference in terms of marketing audio description. And again, that leads me to the place where it kind of who is this for? Mm. This mm -hmm. is for the blind community. This is not for others to just come in and check out, oh, Buster Rhymes is doing this, or whoever is doing this, this is cool, let me check this out. No, that's fine if it happens. That's fine if it happens. But that's not what audio description is for, in my view. Audio description needs to stay around about blind people. now. You can create something else, right? So, for example, when we talk about there are ways that other folks are using audio description, whether they be truck drivers, whether they be um, kids with autism, for example, 
and there may be some modifications that are needed. Absolutely, there should be that, right? We should have that. But I don't think it needs to come at the expense of blind people. So there's room for all of this. And sometimes I feel like there's these fake choices that we're given, mm. right? Do you want more? If you do, then you'll take this. Why do we have to have that choice? That's not the choice. Isn't it ableist to ask our audiences, do you want more or do you want it better? Like no sighted person would ever put up with that. Mm -hmm. If Marvel came out with an announcement saying, you know what, we've got 20 new feature films coming out over the next three years. We're so excited. But you know what? We're going to run out of budget after the first 12. So the last eight, all we're going to do is throw together something. It'll be really cheap, but we can't wait to tell your story. We're so sorry we can't afford it. No Marvel fan would ever put up with that. That would be inconceivably horrific from a marketing perspective for Marvel to do that. And yet our audiences are discriminated against by simply being asked the question, do you want more or do you want better? That that kind of question of, do you want quality or do you want more is absolutely unfair. And when it comes to that, that marketing aspect, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I guess the question is, is at the expense of blind people, is the expense of a blind person not being able to voice it? Or what is the cost to the, the blind audience in the context that you're talking about? Or maybe it's the, the blind talent. I'm not sure. Well, there's both, right? So there, there is the blind talent because we're already competing with non-celebrity, right, talent. We're, there's that competition. That's fine. That should be the case. But there's also, like I said, just the quality. I'm not sure if the quality is naturally going to go up, right? Because folks can make that determine. That, that's what happens with celebrity. You let folks in there just to draw the name. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't make a difference. It, it may not make a difference. In some cases, maybe it does if they're really good. But it may not. I don't think you need to be on audio description unless, yeah. you know, if you yeah. really, unless, unless you're truly going to add value and you know, and you're doing it for the right reason, not to mm. say that, you know, oh, this is because it's not. I think some of the stuff that you talked about just now was like, that's the, the whole idea of audio description being looked at as a charity, as opposed to Ugh. what yeah. it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just, yeah, I mean, and that's that's the other thing. You know, how how often do celebrities want to get attached to something that just feels good and then use it in their promo of themselves? I, mm, you know, mm -hmm. I yeah. just, I, it just gives me a really bad taste and I, I don't want to see audio descriptions suffer because of that. I want to see, we both agree, we want to see audio description expand. We both agree that we want to see more and we want to see better quality. Like we're in total agreement around that. And I think these questions and all of these things as to how do we get there are great. They're, they're yeah, absolutely great. Yes, yes. Because we have the same goal, you know. Mm -hmm. But I just think that we need to kind of think through these things. And even when we try, whatever we try, always come back to the idea of asking that question, does this censor blind people? Are we adding value for our audience? And if we're not, scrap it. There we go. Well, let's talk more about the value because I'm curious, you had said briefly about uh, people with autism or truck drivers benefiting from it, talking about the curb effect of mm -hmm. audio description. <laughs> Most recently we had a lava cake effect where a blind cook was cooking and she said uh, the lava cake was done. The husband said, no, it's not done because he looked at it, but it, it was done and he burned it because he left it in the oven too long. So it's like, that's the, the lava cake effect where cooking shows can be beyond just sight when it comes to mm. appreciating how cooking goes that, that I would consider the curb effect, the lava cake effect in that example. Is there an, audio description effect that you and I could both agree on when it comes to making sure the value is what it, what it is. And I, you know, in the, in the approach that I'm uh, exploring, it's the strategy of awareness to start with awareness that that is an essential part because right now things have been so hidden that people aren't even aware of it. And I think as awareness grows that that can create that 
very healthy competition of how great the audio description can be. But again, that's like a hypothetical approach. I hear your concerns too. What about the value? Like, what is that? What is that curb effect that, that you see? Yeah. So I think I think you're right with the with the awareness. But when I look at awareness, I'm looking at awareness from the perspective of blind people, I because see. I know a lot of blind folks who do not know about audio description. I know mm. a lot of blind mm. folks who think that audio description and television and movies are not for them because that's the way it's been all their lives. And wow. then so yeah. steadily and, and hopefully they're, they're starting to learn more about that. I think that audio description for students and looking at the results of how they're learning and their involvement in the quote unquote mainstream and their ability to relate to their peers and those relationships that happen. I want to measure it by the relationships that employers and employees begin to have because there's more of that conversation and then blind people are making more advancements because we know that when you're in a corporate environment, for example, you learn about new things because you're, you know, you're just friendlier with people. You start mm -hmm. to yeah. you start to trust someone else and you just like to be around that person. You feel comfortable with that person. And so much of that happens from conversations about Game of Thrones, right? On Monday morning after Sunday. I want more blind people involved with that. I want to see blind people who are working as movie critics and doing that where it's not just about the audio description, it's about they're really mm -hmm. analyzing this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Blind mm -hmm. people who are doing the work of audio description, blind people who are commissioning others to do that work. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm centering blind people in this. And so if, if getting that information out in the quote unquote mainstream is getting back to those who may not be really involved in that, right? Because getting the word out to blind people can be hard. It really can be. That's a challenge for those who aren't tuned into stuff. Yeah, I, again, and, and maybe, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to my guns here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yes. I am all about censoring blind people in audio description. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm not that young. I'm not that old. I still consider myself relatively new to disability. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, I have never heard of wheelchair users promoting wheelchairs in malls because folks can just go ahead and walk. They, you know, you, you get tired, so why not take a load off just so we can increase the amount of wheelchairs? You know, you know what I'm saying? We can get better Very wheelchairs good. because more are using yes. it. I don't yeah. think when captioning came out and all the advocacy that they put into it, I don't think they were talking about the curb cut effect you're before right. it happened mm -hmm. it just happened mm -hmm. yeah. and so i'm learning to trust the process and we see it yeah. all the time it will happen right we already know that yes truck drivers are using it and folks will find a purpose for it but let it be that it doesn't have to take away from our community and it will happen it will happen but let's just build it up based on our needs and then when we find something that will, oh, this would work for someone else, absolutely, cool, bring it in, go do it. Go create it. Because we need to bring everybody in, not just some people, we need to bring everybody in. The technology that is available and that is growing means we have more options, mm -hmm. not less. So let's not take away. Don't try to take away my options. Nah, don't do that. So that's where I stand. <laughs> One of the things I love about where you stand is that that centering of blind people, blind audiences specifically. I'm concerned about censoring blind people. The, that seems to be where things could be potentially headed in that a lot of the companies that provide audio description are finding the, the shortcut because it's good enough. It's like, hey, at least it's it's audio description. And that kind of disregard for the centering of the, the blind audiences, I'm, I'm curious how, how that can be approached. And when it comes to the awareness of the content creators being 
aware of it and making sure that blind people are involved in every step possible, that that's, that's an essential part of quality audio description and being able to educate those sighted people that, yeah, that's, that's an essential part. It's not just important, it's essential. And what are your thoughts on that? I think we definitely both agree on this because we talked about it before. And it sounds like <laughs> yes. the, the idea of audio description in the pre- and production process as opposed to the post-production process. That to me is what I'm hearing because, you know, the, the idea that an artist, a content creator, should know about audio description is not so they could just say, hey, cool, that's great, glad to know it. No, it's so that they can be a part of making it better because what they do is crucial to making it better. They're the ones who can leave the space. They're the ones who can incorporate more sound, for example, to communicate things. They're the ones who can use their artful minds to come up with something that will include us. So that's why they need to know about us and they need to respect us. They need to value us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said earlier that 36 million people, they need to realize that's just in the U.S., right? So that, that 36 mm -hmm. million, they need to say, oh, well, yeah, I want 36 million more people <laughs> watching my, my show. Yes. You know, yeah. yeah, I want that. And they need to realize that, oh, it's not just 36 million because Thomas has two daughters and a wife. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they don't watch anything without audio description when we watch things as a family. So they need yeah. to know that because I'm not unique in that sense. There's lots of folks that, that do that as well. But that comes down to that value, that comes back to that respect, that comes down to getting away from that charity model. Yes, yes it comes back to censoring blind people, but it's just, you know, it comes back to freaking just inclusion. Yeah, yeah. It's just bl uh -huh. blind people are not asking for anything special here. Mm -hmm. Just asking for inclusion. That's it. That's it. We want to be included. We want to be included in the film. We want to be included in the conversations. We want to be included in the society, period. And everybody knows that media, whether it be, you know, movies, television, live theater, whatever the case is, whatever visual content, like that's society. Those are, those are conversations that are taking place that are about either something that happened or where we're going that we need to be a part of. We don't need to find these things out later on, last minute, secondhand conversations. Like, no, we just need to be included. And with that inclusion, is there a place at the table for blind people to be able to influence those decision makers? And I, I gotta say, I worked for a post-production sound company for, for many years and it was great to see the care and consideration that the directors would have when going into the sound mix studio for days. One scene can take hours, one three minute scene where they're making sure that all the, I mean, from our perspective, knobs and levers and dials and buttons and everything are pushed just right so that it gives that immersive experience. That That is the kind of care that goes into the post-production side, that the separation, I believe that we're talking about with audio description is past post, it's post post-production. That's the film's done and then it gets handed off like it's this second thing to do mm -hmm. audio description. So uh, it's just a little a little nuance there that, that I, uh, I wanted to, to throw out there. When it comes to that, um, the impact of inclusion of society, is there not a case to be made that the existing leaders, when it comes specifically to television, are a part of the, the television academy. That access to those decision makers right now, specifically blind people to be included in that, seems worthwhile. Forget the awards. Okay, because I was like, oh, I like your Kung Fu there. <laughs> so, oh, I, 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 I kind of switched that around. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but now, but, <laughs> no, 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 but, but no, because yes, I mean, influences, we need influence. And, and I get that, right? So if a way to get that influence is to be a part, you know, you have to be in the room. Mm -hmm. And if a way to get in the room is through being a part of an award show, 
<laughs> I could hear your voice. I could hear the way you said a words. Talk about intention. <laughs> you <laughs> go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. That was great. No. If I have to go through the awards show. <laughs> no, but but that I mean that part of it absolutely makes sense. You know, advocacy takes place in the room. Advocacy takes place on the streets. Mm-hmm. So there's there's room for all of that. And if we're working together in the suites and the streets, <laughs> if yeah. we're working together and we're coordinated and we're all sort of, again, censoring blind people, mm-hmm. I'm with that. I'm with that. I think I think that can be powerful. Thomas, you briefly touched on this. I'm curious if we could go off on a little tangent of generosity. In the context that you were speaking of, it, generosity was a, a negative connotation in my mind in the sense that it's almost a condescending talking down. It's a... Uh, it's not good. It just, it, it smells bad. I'm not sure how else to put it. Yeah. What's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of that negative generosity, that, that almost looking down and, oh, I'm going to be generous to the, to the blind people. What's the opposite of that? I mean, the, the first word that comes to my mind when you were saying that is, is respect. Mm, yes. You know, that, that version of charity, you know, I think about it in the real world in real life i think about it when walking into a store and just the difference in treatment you know being in a restaurant and someone asking the person that a you know a blind person is with if they're sighted what does he or she want oh, yeah. you know what i mean as though as though i can't communicate to them um just simply based on that these are the same very similar feelings that are triggered when, you know, when we having these conversations around audio description. For me, it always comes back to respect because if someone is not looking at me as an equal, wherever we are, then that problem is not necessarily with me, but I do feel it because I'm not getting the service, whatever that may be, I'm not getting that, that equal treatment or that equitable treatment right Mm -hmm. it's just not happening because of the way they view me and it's that perspective that they have around blindness around disability that is what i think the awareness that i i don't even say that i want to do but that i hope i do that if i wanted to reach out to folks to non-disabled people it's really in hopes that that is the message that they get that, and, and in fact, I mean, that happens with, with blind people too. It's ableism. It's ableism. It's, it's looking at disability in a certain way as if it is less than, as it's, it's not normal. Mm-hmm. And it is normal. It's absolutely normal. And there's so much that we're missing out because we don't respect and appreciate the contributions of disabled folks. And specifically, we're talking about blind and low vision. Concern comes to me when we say, if others become aware of audio description, for example, it's not really helpful if they're just looking at it. Oh, isn't that nice? That's great. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful that they do that for the blind people. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't well, help. It doesn't help well, at all. Yeah. In that case, it makes it worse because that respect is disrespect. I get it. Yeah. It's really, it's really clear. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, Roy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a genie. <laughs> oh boy, I give, oh boy, oh boy. I give you a genie with These one. These hypotheticals, <laughs> yes. Bring it. With one audio description wish. <laughs> something that can change something about AD, whatever it is, good, bad, worse, whatever. whatever. What are you going to ask of that genie? parody to sighted audiences. That when it comes to audio description, the experience of a blind or low vision person is as equal to a sighted person as possible. That they're laughing at the same time. That they're able to turn it on as easily as a sighted person. That they're able to watch it at the same time that it's released as 
a sighted person, that they're able to go from cinema to streaming in the same way that a sighted person does. That they're able to get the quality and excellence of the performances, of the writing, of the mix, of the quality control that sighted people get with their track. That parody in the sense of as equal as possible is a part of audio description. That is done, by the way, by blind experts being paid for their value and their service. The, those two things are so linked in my head that you can't have one without the other and you can't have the other without the one. That There is no way that audio description quality and excellence to be in parity to sighted audiences can happen without blind professionals being paid for their value. So that's, that's one. It sounds like two things, but you can't have one without the other as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and you see what's cool about that is that um, I could wish for the what I just said about respect and I think we, we end up in the same place because I think if you got your wish, I feel like my wish was granted because I don't think that could happen without respect. And again, look how that would filter outside of audio description because that's what audio description does, right? It's, it's not just about the film and the movie. It always applies to something bigger. Yeah, and that's the model. That's like this little microcosm of audio description and how that can have a ripple effect. Yeah, and it does. You can look at audio description and touch on lots of things. Look at how, how race, gender, all of this stuff about identity come into play. Like, there's so much. <laughs> there's yeah. so much. And you going back to what you said earlier about students, the education, the educational aspect of this, that I, I don't know, man. I think modeling movies and TVs can have a direct impact on those other kinds of essential access the, yeah. I don't know there's a there's a really like is is it time to as as your uh, podcast uh, uh, limited series is called flip the script can I flip the script and ask you the same genie question go for it <laughs> oh did I just answer it though because <laughs> <laughs> well you did but I, I guess you and I have different approaches to it and I'm curious how the respect that you deserve is accomplished because I think you've answered it in every answer and every question that you've asked. I think it's mm. there. But I, I do have an answer, so you can ask me the question. Okay. Yeah. If you had a genie and it could give you anything <laughs> you wanted with audio description, how would you earn that respect within audio description? I know I kind of manipulated by adding in respect, <laughs> but I had to. <laughs> See, I kind of want to go back to my childhood and, and then ask the genie for three more wishes. <laughs> sure. Perfect. Let's do it. Let's go for three. No, no, three. no. I'm just, I'm just joking. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. But but I, think, I got two kind of. <laughs> but I would really ask the genie to solve this problem, this issue that happens also often, and it's just like I just want to be rid of it. That when my family and I decide, just at the spur of the moment, to sit down and watch a movie, that we don't have to go through about a half an hour because there's no audio description. Yeah, it it doesn't fail. It does not fail. And the feeling that I get is the same. Even though I, I play it cool, you know, and I say, oh, just go ahead and watch it. I, I do it all the time, and they tell me no. And and now the girls are older, and so they're more they're more bold with the way they tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I can't do anything about it anymore. <laughs> and But it still feels the same. And and it's not just me, because they get frustrated. Like, why does this, why can't they put on audio description? These freaking ableists, they're using all of these terms. I want the genie to resolve that for us. That's what I want. And again, like with what you said, I think it will accomplish all of what we want. I really heard your, not only about the respect, but also about all the implications of, of centering blind audiences and talents in this work and the value, the inclusion, the the differences between sighted people getting involved versus the respect that it's due. That that really is sticking well with me. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. So, Thomas, here's another follow-up. I am curious when it comes to audio description, which was created by blind people for blind people, that blind people need to be included in this work. And not just blind people, but blind professionals. And when it comes to the creation of audio description, there's something that seems similar to the access that comes from a 
let's say an Android device or an iOS, like an iPhone, that blind people can use this, <laughs> this screen <laughs> that you have to see to tap on. And it's got only two or three buttons along the edge, but primarily everything that's happening on the screen, the blind people can use that effortlessly and nobody has any problems whatsoever with that kind of device and that kind of communication that happens. Are there some parallels to audio description creation as far as professional blind talents go? So I'll back up a little bit because I, I don't think it's necessarily true that everyone knows that blind people can, for example, use iPhones or use an Android phone. There's still a lot of misinformation about that or and fascination sometimes. Oh, wow. And so yeah. there's still like, oh, you know, you'll see the jokes on Twitter or, or wherever there was a guy, a blind guy with a white cane, and he's looking at his phone. What is he doing? You know, that type of thing. Oh, yeah. And and folks have, have no idea. But what it comes down to is that, for me, it comes down, again, to ableism. Deep-rooted ableism. Not saying anything negative about the person, because I think for so many of us, it's not our fault. And I put myself in that category, because I'm not immune to it. Technology is used by everyone. If someone's listening to this, they're using technology, <laughs> right? Technology is an assistant. There's no difference. Your assistant is for you because you have access to vision. You can see. If someone is using it, they're accessing that same information, using that same or some other technology, using their ears or their hands as in a braille display, so be it. That's cool. It's just technology, but we put this difference in there because it's not normal. It's again, it goes back to what's how normal is perceived. And the normal way of doing this is you grab your phone, you put it in, you know, you grab your wallet, you leave your house, you get in your car, you go to your job that does this, like this is the normal thing. But anything that strays away from what you know as normal is abnormal. So when it comes down to blind people creating audio description, I can say that, yes, I, I get it. People want to know how it's done. I'll tell you whatever you want. You ask me. I mean, for the most part, like unless you're being disrespectful, but I'll answer questions on my time when I want to. Not all the time. Don't don't anybody call me. <laughs> but but I will answer a lot of questions because I get the fact I understand that people are interested and hopefully, when I explain it, they realize how little they actually thought about it before they asked the question, because that, that is the truth. So when folks ask, oh, how do you do narration? Well, the way I do it is very similar to the way sighted folks do it, except I'm taking in information through my ears and then narrating it again using my voice the same way someone else would do it. So the only difference is in how I'm taking in that information and, and the tools that I'm using. So I'll have a screen reader where someone obviously is just using their eyes. They don't have a screen reader, but we both have computers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we both might be using the same tools to manipulate, right? Maybe it's a word mm -hmm. processor or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing audio production, I tend to use Reaper, other use Pro Tools, whatever the case may be. But the end result is the same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. And that's all that matters, but we focus on how is it being done. Now, I get that from the non-blind community, those who have no idea, but sometimes it hurts when it comes from the blind community because it seems to have sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes there seems to be this, oh, how are you doing it? I can't believe you're doing it. Are you getting something special? Are you getting some sort of special treatment? And that is not cool. That's that internal ableism, again, that I talked about, that, yes, blind people have. I think about it from the perspective of those who are writing audio description. I've been saying this for a while. Y'all can check the receipts. Go back. Go back and listen to the old podcast. I've been saying, even though I didn't know anyone at the time, but I've been saying that blind people could write audio description because writing audio description is really about the wordsmithing, right? It's about that's the big part of it. That's mm -hmm. the big part of it. And so however you can get access to the visuals, then you get access to those visuals. And so 
Some people have their methods, and they're all great, whatever they are, but they're still doing the work. They're still doing the work. And that's what people need to understand. And for me, if we really want to make that change, we have to start within ourselves. And I mean as individuals and as a community. So we have to check our own ableism. We have to support each other when we're doing these things and and just uplift one another. If we're going to get to a place... And again, going back to that idea that we don't want charity, then we need to show that. We need to uplift ourselves as opposed to being pushed up or being pulled up solely by non-blind folks. Like, we have to be a part of that. I hope that makes sense. It does. There are a few things that are exceptionally sticking out. uh, In the earlier part, you made a distinction between a person who's interested versus a person who's fascinated. And the meaning behind those two words, that interested comes from a place of curiosity, fascinated comes with a tinge of, you said ableism, that there's this, oh my God, you can do that? If I were to compare that to the tools that I use, like right now I'm recording into a microphone that's plugged into a computer that's somewhat connected to the internet, God knows how, and there are these wave files that come out and it's like that's the tool that i'm able to to use to to share my voice and then i've got the headset in my ears that is translating these these waveforms that are coming through the earpieces that are coming through a wire that are plugged into something else that's plugged into the computer it's like these are the tools that i have that i just take advantage of because they're so familiar they're so normal And one of the things that I'm most excited about when it comes to audio description, particularly with blind professionals being compensated for their work, is that that is being normalized as well in the sense that it's not even a glitch, that I can just put on a headset, plug in a mic, hit record, or you hit record in this case, and be (laughs) able to to connect with you and not even think about, oh, I got to thank the, the microphone manufacturer. I got to thank the, uh, the cord manufacturer or the USB-C inventor that was able to be plug into mm-hmm. the, the computer. And I want to make sure that I thank the, the operating system that's been developed for years and years and thank God that they did that. And isn't it great that there was an email program that I could email you to make sure that my schedule was coordinated thanks to the scheduling program. It's like all these things are normal. There's not a conversation about it. In, in this case, I'm interested in how it works, but the fascination of it, has been eliminated because it's so common and normalized. I don't want to say common because it's so normal. This is normal. And I like that it's normal because I've done it a bunch of times. And I'm wondering if there's some sort of analogy here with this kind of connection, with this kind of normalizing the tools that I use, which are kind of the same as yours in this case. <laughs> I mean, is that is there something to that? Yeah, because I was going to say, I use exactly the same method. (laughs) The the only difference, right? The only difference. I have an extra earbud in because I use a screen reader. And Mm -hmm. that screen reader is being outputted on a separate channel, separate uh, sound card, Mm -hmm. because I don't want it to interfere with our conversation Mm. in terms of being recorded. And so I have an extra earbud that's underneath my other earphones. Well, can I be so sarcastic (laughs) and ableist and say, well, you can't be doing it then because. Yeah, because Jaws is doing it for me, right? So Jaws Jaws. is in there. I haven't heard you mention Jaws. We've been on the phone for like. (laughs) Yeah. But that's it. That's okay. So you've got an earpiece. So what? That's. Should I be fascinated by that? <laughs> no. And, and you know, it's funny. Like, What's that? I, I almost was ableist because I was going to say, and there's no one else in here with me. But you know what? Let's say I was not working the computer. That's okay, too. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Right? Yeah. Because there are some mm-hmm. folks who, who don't have movement within their hands, but they're still doing that work because the, the creation is coming from their mind. And their yes. voice. Yeah. And so that's okay. And who's who's to judge them? And and yeah. the truth of the matter is that before you were doing this stuff at home, you had an engineer who was pushing buttons for you. Still do. Yeah. And it's like in that example, both examples that you're giving, it's I'm able to focus on the work 
in your example, the, the person who's disabled is able to focus on their work. That's it. It's, it, it's relieving some of the, yeah, I could, I, mean, I could be an air traffic controller and make sure that everything's all tweaked and adjusted, but my performance is going to be different if I do have, let me be clear on this, a support or assistant. It's not a, it's not a partner or someone who's above me mm-hmm. who's telling me how to do things. It's me. I'm in charge. I'm right. the one that's saying, here's what I need, and you're going to provide access to it. You're going to be my assistant. You're going to be my subordinate. And I'm not saying you specifically, Thomas, yeah. but the analogy goes the same for disabled talents. I was going to say people, but I want to go back to it's not just random people, that there's there are talents, there are experts that know this stuff who are disabled, who are blind. That's what that hesitation was from. Yeah. It's not just random people that are disabled. I get that. And one of the things that is I, you caught yourself, I'm I'm catching myself left and right just simply because I have sight, because I'm so familiar with with sight that when it comes to making sure that audio description is being represented by blind and low vision people and professionals, it's like there still is that connection. And I got to thank you for not only your podcast, but your engagement with all sighted people and the time and generosity that you've given. And you haven't needed to, to be able to, to share all your stories. And I, I just have to believe that the respect that you do deserve is coming and it's it's been there it's not that it's not there but it's uh thank you you've changed the conversation you've changed the culture when it comes to this work and i i trust that you recognize that both through your own efforts and your podcast and all the other things that you're doing that many of us might not even be aware of you're doing it and it's like however sighted people like myself can support those efforts and be there to to do not because I'm sighted and I know what I'm doing, but because I am someone who believes in what you're saying and I want to support that message because you're the one that's leading the cause here. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. I, I appreciate what you said. And I think that um, I do and I don't know. <laughs> if, Fair enough. Yeah, I do and I don't know. But what I what I do know is that I just want to see that respect given to other people too. I want to see folks who are really trying to do and doing, yeah, I think they they deserve, we all deserve that. We really do. And like I said, I, I caught myself because I don't think it's a sighted thing. I think it's a thing that if you're, if you're raised in this culture, in this world, maybe some cultures more than the other, but definitely here in the States, you got some ableism in you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You got you got some isms in you, period. Because that is just the way we are raised. And a lot of that goes back to the media, right? So if we want to bring it all the way back, but but so much of that in the educational system and all of that. But mm-hmm. and it's up to ourselves to to check ourselves. Like we have to do that and recognize it. Mm-hmm. So I'm on that path. You're on that path, you know. I salute you for that, and yeah, man. Let's let's if we could get more people doing it, I think that would be great. But it, it and especially again because I'm I'm so focused on centering blind people. Mm-hmm. Hey, let us do it, and let us just you know tone it down and and <laughs> you know lift up, lift up. Let's lift mm-hmm. each other up. We we do some of that damage. I think some of it is good and some of it is is uh, I have a beef with and I'll probably talk about it. But, so, you know, like the all of the this is how I do YouTube videos, blog posts, podcasts. Right. This is how a blind person does blah, 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 blah. There's so, so much of that. Sure. And I'm not sure if that adds or if it's clearing up because a lot of it puts the emphasis on the technology and not on us as people. And it doesn't show, you know, yeah, we can use an iPhone and folks, oh, that's nice. They could use an iPhone. But no, I want to see, I want to see what you do with that iPhone now that you have access to it. Don't just tell me you, you know, you're perusing the web or whatnot. No, what you going to do with it? Yeah. Yeah. What a great conversation. Thank you for every moment of it. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 